We are happy to have here today Joe Randall, Brian Roberts, and uh, Eliza Kingley. They are coming from the Northern Territory Fisheries, the Department of Industry, Tourism, and something up. Yeah. Right. Trade. <laughs> All right. <Okay. laughs> My paper didn't bring that part. Sorry. And <laughs> so Eliza will be speaking about the Australian Society for Fish and Biology. And we also have uh, Dr. Joe Rendell with Coastal Line Fisheries. Uh, she, she has also conducted her studies here in, in Rio, CDU. The same for Dr. Brian, who is working with Parmundi and has conducted the PhD studies in Rio, while Eliza is more on a management position, if I understood that right, uh, working within the offshore net and line fisheries. So welcome, we get started and let's go. Uh, so Northern Territory Fisheries works to um, support the sustainable management of fisheries in the NT. Um, while there's a big focus on management, we also have um, a strong research team to support that management. Um, we have the World Harvest Team, which is based in Verima, and we also have the Darwin Aquaculture Centre, and that's over at Channel Island. Um, we won't be talking any more on that one. Um, they look at uh, barramundi, like dewfish, oysters, and some other things. Um, and there's a real focus on the research to feed directly into the sustainable management. Um, today, I focus as part of the research team mostly on the coastal line. So, I'm going to be talking about some past, present, um, and future research in black dewfish um, and also golden snapper, among other reef species. Um, Brian will then take over and have the talk about barramundi fishery and the research going on in that space. Um, and I think mangrove jack as well. Um, and then Eliza is going to jump in and talk about. Um, the Fisheries 101 program that we've got going there um, and some career um, graduate opportunities at Fisheries, as well as um, a bit of a talk about emerging stuff in the days. Um, so black dewfish, we've had a lot of research on black dewfish over the past, particularly in the past decade. Um, most of this work has been a collaboration involving CDU and um, NT Fisheries, um, often AIMS as well, among others. Um, uh, about 2017 was when it was most of it was published. They did a big lot of work on parasitology and odorless microchemistry, um, looking at the fine scale spatial uh, stock structure. Um, and some of the things they found here was that it's actually really small scales that these stocks exist, so tens to hundreds of kilometres. Um, a more recent project that I led um, when I was working here at CDU um, was looking at some of the environmental drivers behind um, population health and physiology in the species. Um, in 2015, I think it was, they had a stock assessment that listed the species as overfished. So there was quite a bit of panic there. Um, and then the next couple of years, there was this unexpected high recruitment. Um, so it was really apparent that there was a real knowledge gap there, um, what was really driving the fishery. Um, so this project um, looked at, among other things, stabilised to food web tracking. Um, and a really cool finding there, you can see on that plot, um, this is um, carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur, um, and you can see if I get this right. Um, these little, really tight couplings of this dark blue there. Um, the left is dry season, the right is um, wet season, um, and regardless of season, their their diet is really niche. Um, the triangles here, sorry. Um, mostly on the right of each plot are the marine food sources and the circles mostly on the left of each plot are the fresh water. So they're really strongly marine um, based in their diet, uh, mostly crustaceans and small fish. Um, another thing we found that contrary to a lot of species up here, um, when you have a really good wet season, um, their condition actually falls. Um, so there's a negative correlation between strong wet seasons and health in the fishery. Um, we also did a, a load of age and reproduction stuff, and that's kind of led to a new project we're looking at, um, a potential age truncation in some of the heavily fished um, aggregations. 
Uh, so the plot on the top here, that was done about 20 years ago um, by a researcher, Phelan, and he found the modal age in these aggregations was sitting somewhere around three to four. Um, the plot on the bottom, you can see that this is sitting around two to three, mostly three-year-olds, and although this doesn't look like a big difference, when you're looking at three to four-year-old, mostly fish, that's, that's quite a big job. Um, what was interesting is when we we looked a bit further into it and it, it's largely driven by the most heavily fished aggregations. Um, so there was no change in one of the lightly fished aggregations at Sampan. Um, and then one of the aggregations, Caution Point, was actually close to fishing in 2015 and that aggregation has seen an increase in a year in their age. Um, why does it matter? The most recent stock assessment um, estimated that 93% biomass um, in the fishery. And while that looks really good for the fishery, this is kind of indicating that there's more going on in there um, that we need to look at. Um, the prior stock assessments were really strongly based on catch per unit effort, which isn't really that useful in a highly aggregative fish. Um, so we're looking at um, bringing some of this age structure stuff into new models um, using different models um, that's work starting at the moment. Um, I don't know how many people here are fishy people, but we age fish using the ear bones, the otoliths. Um, it's kind of like tree rings. The plot of the, the picture at the top there shows really clear increments. Each one of those is a year. Um, this is actually a Queensland black dewfish otolith. On the bottom, you've got the Northern Territory black dewfish otolith, um, and you can see that it's a bit of a mess. Um, they're really hard to age because we don't have that clear laying down of increments. Um, this holds true with golden snapper and anchor jack, quite a lot of reefs fish up here. Um, it's also quite a lot of work um, preparing all these otoliths to age them as well. Black dewfish otoliths are about that big. That takes a lot of time. Um, so we're collecting samples concurrently with all of our otoliths sampling as well to now look into the future and um, DNA methylation. It's been shown on fish species to be really accurate for ageing. Um, a lot less time consuming in a way and cost effective than what you take into the labour of doing all the otoliths. Um, so that's something that's um, upcoming potentially. Um, and we've also got a, a project starting that Keller is working with Michael Usher, um, post release mortality in reef fish. Um, a lot of our fish that are main recreational species, um, it's really difficult to catch and release they suffer this barrier trauma um, and uncertainties around this post-release mortality make it really hard to accurately assess the stocks. Um, you can't just use um, data that you've got from other jurisdictions because our fish are behaving differently. We're finding even in three metres of water you're getting this explosion of their swim bladders um, and they're suffering barrier trauma, this fish here. That's actually the stomach has been inverted through the mouth. Um, so these fish aren't getting released in some way. Um, so this project's um, going to look at a whole load of different things, um, tagging of the fish, some um, temperature and O2 trials potentially um, at the aquaculture facility, and hopefully look into unravelling some of the uh, some of the background issues that are occurring here, whether it be a lactic acid um, stress buildup, um, temperature, higher temperatures, lower DO in the water. Probably so, yeah. so um yeah, I suppose it's not a unique challenge that a lot of us face within the territory and that we've got a fairly small research team trying to manage stocks across a very large spatial area. We need to conduct regular stock assessments across dozens of species to track how things are going. And historically, inevitably, there's just been some limitations in the way that that's been done. One of the key assumptions of doing any sort of stock assessment is you need to have some sort of idea of the spatial scale at which sort of a stock is operating. And 
often just out of the inherent limitations of, of, of what we've been doing, those, those assessments have just been conducted at the scale of the Northern Territory. So basically bowling all the catch data across the Northern Territory to see how things are going. But clearly what's happening in the Gulf of Carpentaria has got limited relevance to what's happening around Darwin, particularly some of the more recreationally targeted species. Um, that approach has got some pretty serious limitations. So in recent years, it's been a really sort of big push to get a better understanding of, of, of stock structure for, for some of our key species. Because we need to have a really good understanding of if, if you do have an area that's depleted by fishing pressure, to what extent that, that are getting replenished by fish from by recruitment coming in from, from other areas. So there's been a lot of work done in that space. There's been a lot of work done on species like black jewfish and golden snapper, um, barramundi being the obvious ones. But for some of the sort of key species, there's still some pretty significant knowledge gaps. Mangrove jack is certainly one of those species. So mangrove jack, or anyone who sort of fishes recreationally will be aware of these fish. They're really commonly targeted by fishes. They're long lived, they're late maturing, and they're an aggregating species. And these are all traits that are really associated with, with species that are susceptible to fishing pressure, susceptible to localised depletion. So these fish have um, undergo ju juvenile development sort of inshore in, in freshwater in some cases, but generally in estuaries and nearshore environments, and then have that sort of ontogenetic offshore migration as they mature. So there's been some previous genetic work done on these species. It's basically um, assessed the entire population across Australia, which spans from Sydney right around the coast, um, right around northern Australia, around Perth, to, is essentially is a, is a single population. So sort of genetic techniques have got some pretty clear limitations. Um, this is a species that has been assessed at the, um, at the jurisdictional level for, for the Northern Territory. Um, so there's a very clear need for this species to develop some more sophisticated tools to, to establish at what sort of spatial scale these sites are operating at. This is a project currently underway, which is being led by Grant Johnson. Um, which basically aimed to develop some new tools to come up with um, some more appropriate measures of um, stock structure for mangrove jack. So one of the ways that we do this is we take a, a few different methods, um, complementary methods that um, can give us a, a, a much clearer picture of what's going on. So there's some recent genetic tools which can give a much, uh, much clearer picture of the spatial scale that, that stocks are operating at. We can also look at obelisk microchemistry. So obelisks, as Joe was, Joe was talking about before, those, those ear bones in the fish, they're precipitated from the surrounding water. So we can look at chemical chemical signatures in obelisks from different fish to work out what degree of mixing has been going on from different areas. Same thing with parasites. So fish, like all animals, have got parasites attached to them. And you can look at the assemblage of those parasites to work out how much fish are, fish, fish are mixing from different areas. Uh, there's also a pretty clear need to describe the level of inshore and offshore connectivity um, between Carnarvon and Cape York. So this is the area where those um, commercial troll fisheries are operating. And it's also a great opportunity to get, to get the community involved and get fishers involved in some, in some hands-on research. So on that note, um, opportunity for a shout out if um, anyone's out catching mangrove jack, which I'll fling at you. Um, Keep the frames, not to kill itself, and keep the frames to the few different places where you can where you can drop them off and you'll get a free lure and more importantly get the um get the knowledge that you're contributing to some pretty important science. It's um it's pretty hard to get away with talking anything about fisheries in the Northern Territory without without talking about barramundi. Um Obviously, a very iconic fishery and the fishery that everyone cares about. It's um it certainly has its challenges working in working in the anything to do with the management of, of barramundi. Um, but it's also a good opportunity because it's you know it, it's it's actually a great thing to have so many people invested in a fishery. There's no shortage of fisheries around the world that are a shadow of what they were because people didn't care enough. So class up full full approach. It's a it's a, it's a really good thing. So anyone who fishes for barramundi will know that 
they are very much an environmentally driven species. And this actually has some challenges from a management perspective because those sort of more traditional stock assessment type approaches don't really work for things that are so heavily influenced by the environment. So one of the ways that this species can be managed better, it's got better accounting for that natural environment, environmental variation and understanding how that's influencing populations. So wet seasons clearly drive the productivity of, of barren populations. And that happens at two different scales. So firstly, if you get a good wet season, you get good fishing immediately afterwards. Everyone talks about the runoff, that's why. You get a good wet season, fish are more concentrated, fish are feeding harder, fish are easier to catch. And that's true both recreationally and commercially. But on longer time scales, you get a pulse in recruitment. So you get a good wet season, you get higher recruitment. And in three, four, five years' time, as those fish reach a size where they can be caught, you get this secondary boost of productivity. So one of the challenges with um, working in the Northern Territory is any ecologist in the room will, will know all about too well. Getting environmental data is really challenging. Rainfall data is pretty spatially limited generally. Flow data is even worse. Um, especially if you're trying to go back through time and, and look at historical data. So what we've honed in on is this Australian Monsoon Index, or the AMI, which is which is the variable that's that's captured by the bomb. And all this is this is very average rainfall across northern Australia, essentially north of the tropical Capricorn or thereabouts. On the face of things, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to take such a broad scale climatic variable and then apply that to what's happening in an individual catchment or an individual river. What we've actually found is that it works surprisingly well. So we've applied this to different aspects of, of barramundi biology. We've, we've linked it to recruitment, we've linked, linked it to migra migration patterns. Talking to the guys over in Queensland, they've had really good success um, applying it to recruitment in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Same thing in Western Australia. So we've applied this, this variable right across the top end and invariably it does not only a really good job, but just as good a job as that local um, hydrological data where we do have it. So this is an example of that. This is showing the correlation between Barramundi year class strength and the Australian monsoon index across four different systems spanning the Northern Territory. So we've got the MacArthur and the Roper down in the Gulf and the Daly and the Mary a bit closer to Darwin. So that solid black line is the, um, is the Australian Monsoon Index and the coloured lines represent year class strength, the Barramundi and those four different systems. So you've got a very clear correlation between the two that holds true across catchments. And this is what the Australian Monsoon Index looks like when you go back through time. So... Obviously, the um, it's a standardised index, so positive values represent above average wet seasons and the red bars represent below, below average wet seasons. So very clear trends. Um, a lot of us that were around might remember in, around 2019, 2020, we had a couple of back-to-back -back failed wet seasons. Well, if you go back to the 1980s through the early 90s, that was actually the norm. We've had a really dry period through the 80s and early 90s there. Around the turn of the millennium, something flipped and we had a series of really good wet seasons and sort of in more recent years we've had a bit of a mix that'll become important in a few slides um, so great we've got this really cool index that we can use to describe the, the productivity of barrel populations but then the challenge becomes okay how do we use this how do we apply this in some sort of way that's meaningful for management the inlets have got some pretty clear problems, which we won't go into today around um, bycatch. Um, very well documented problems, but hear me out. From a fish point of view, gillnets actually do exactly what you want them to do. They're very selective at the, at the species they target. So Barramundi and King Threadfin make up more, over 95% of the catch of the fish catch in, in gillnets. And they also target the size of fish that you're wanting to target. So in the case of Barramundi, they're really targeting fish in that to 85 centimetre bracket. So smaller fish physically can't get caught in gill nets because they just swim through them and larger fish tend to either push through them or just bounce off. Big fish don't get caught very often in gill nets. And of course, those are the fish in you know, a changing species like barramundi. Those are the big reproductively available females and also the fish that are recreational 
try to care about. So what we've got here, this is showing some growth data derived from odolites from four different systems in the, in the Northern Territory. So on the y-axis, we've got growth, and on the x-axis, we've got age. So they're showing how much the fish grows in their systems in a given year. So as fish grow older, growth slows down. Right? And this is showing some pretty clear differences among catchments. So we've got the fastest growth rates happening in the Mary system, intermediate growth rates happening in the daily, and down in the Gulf and the MacArthur and the Roper, things are growing a bit more slowly. Water temperatures are a bit cooler, dry seasons are a bit colder, um, growth rates just aren't as fast. It's always nice when you get multiple lines of evidence sort of telling the same story. So this is showing the age composition of commercial catch in, in, the, in some of these systems. So in the daily, in the daily system, uh, fish are mostly entering the, the fishery as four-year-olds. That's when they're becoming susceptible to catch, catch up. And by sort of six years plus, most of those fish are no longer susceptible to gillnets. In the Mary system, where growth rates are a little bit faster, fish are tending to enter their fishery a little bit earlier. And in the rope, where growth rates are slower, fish aren't really entering the fishery until they're four, five, six years of age. But because they're growing slowly, they remain susceptible to catch it for a lot longer. So what we've been working on is something we're calling the Barrett Index, which is a catchable barramundi abundance in relation to rainfall and all this. <laughs> and what this does is catches both the age structure of the fish population with rainfall events to work out when we've got periods, when we've got successive periods of good wet seasons coming through, meaning we've got a relatively high abundance of catchable cohorts and vice versa. And you can use this to, uh, to adjust management accordingly. So the first thing we look at is we look at all the age classes that are present in the fishery. This is an example from Anson Bay last year. So this is as it would be applied to Anson Bay for last year's fishing season. So we know all of the year classes that those age classes are attributed to. And we also know how strong the wet season was in each of those years. So for example, last wet season 12 months ago, we had a really good wet season, that's that 0.28 value, that, that, blue, that blue square there. And then we consider how much each of those age classes contributes to commercial catch. And what this does, this gives us a weighting. So last year's really good wet season, all those fish are zero pluses. They're not susceptible to catch it. Those aren't contributing to fishery productivity. So those aren't weighted in this, um, in this score at all. So basically we add those together and that gives us a picture of the relative abundance of those catchable cohorts. So we're coming up with a negative value for last year's fish which for anyone that fished the daily last year was probably a bit counterintuitive because fishing was really good in the daily last year, right? It's simply because we had a really good wet season. And remember that when you get a good wet season, fishing is going to be good pretty much regardless of what's happened previously. So that negative score is really driven by those failed wet seasons we had in back in 2018, 19 and 2019, 20. So those cohorts are virtually absent from the fishery. So the next test is to hindcast this data and then see how this applies to commercial catch per unit effort data. It's um, more problematic presenting this to ecologists than fishermen because ecologists know what R squared means and some of these R squareds aren't necessarily fantastic. But what you do notice is that we have got positive significant slopes for, for, all, of those, for all of those different areas. Um, so this is actually saying this is doing a pretty good job at explaining um, um, explaining catch rates. So the data is inherently very noisy. That's just because catch per unit effort data is in a lot of ways more reflective of what fishes are doing than what fish are doing. And it's also very heavily influenced by that, by that, um, by that current wet season. So remembering that fishing is good if you get a good wet season, regardless of what's happened previously. So we can use this information to, to then sort of pick out periods when we know we've got a higher abundance of those catchable fish and vice versa, have addition, additional um, management sort of strategies in place when we know that when we know that the population size is lower. One of the cool things about this is that um, it allows us a degree of looking forward. So we don't know what the rest of this wet season is going to bring. We don't know what next year is going to do, but we've got a good picture of what the wet season is 
in years gone past have done, and those fish aren't entering the fishery for a few years to come. So last year, um, things weren't so good in Anson Bay, but that will continue to improve over the next couple of years, um, particularly as that really strong year class from, from last year's wet season begins to enter the fishery. And of course, if we get a terrible wet season in that time, things are still going to be pretty tough to catch. This is um, sort of verging into management territory a bit, I suppose, but it provides some interesting context for, for the Barramundi fishery and the history of how it's operated. So the Barramundi fishery today is actually a relatively small scale fishery in the Northern Territory. It used to be a lot larger and it still is a lot larger over in Queensland. So what we've got on this graph is we've got a couple of pieces of information. We've got historical commercial catch and we've got historical commercial catch per unit effort. So CPUE, catch per unit effort, that's the line. So that's we're sort of using that as a bit of a proxy for biomass. So during the early 1980s, CPUE is looking really low, a fair sign that, that things are in trouble. No one can catch a fish. We talk to recreational anglers who were fishing at that time. Consensus seems to be pretty universally. That was a tough time to catch a barrel in the NT. Uh, catch the unit effort is steadily increased, um, peaking during the early 2000s. And in the last few years, it's sort of declined a little bit. Important to note that that's nothing to do with fish stocks. It's um, a combination of things. But this is the, the number of commercial licenses that's been, that's been operating in the Northern Territory throughout that time. So in response to, um, to concerns around barrow stocks, there was a whole heap of license buyouts and a dramatic decline in the commercial fishing production that went into this fishery. So you can see basically those two graphs align very nicely. So as the fishing pressure has declined, CPUE has gone up like clockwork. And this was obviously a fantastic look for the managers. It's look, look we, 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 we managed the fishery and things got better. Perfect story. But watch what happens when you replace the commercial fishing pressure with the AMI. So you can see that that historical period of, of low abundance very much coincides with a period of historically poor wet seasons. And as as um, as CBUE has increased, that aligns pretty much spot on with those really intense wet seasons around the turn of the millennium. And, yeah, the correlation between AMI and, and CBUE is, is really solid the whole way through. So yeah, I suppose the key, the key point here is that you know this recovery in the in the barrack fishery that, that that's happened over time is realistically largely a product of natural environmental variation. And this sort of lines up with what we know about the biology of barramundi. They are an extraordinarily extraordinarily productive species, one of the most fecund fishes on the face of the earth. So their ability to support um, support really productive fisheries is pretty much unmatched. So we kind of find ourselves in the interesting sort of space where most of the variation in people's ability to catch the barramundi can't actually be managed. It's largely an environmentally, um, you know, not that we want to put fisheries out of a job or anything like that, but it's predominantly an environmentally driven fishery. And there's nothing that fisheries can do that's going to lead to dramatic changes in how the fisheries performs, which is, you know, if we think about it, people that fish, you sort of know it. There's a lot of places where there's no commercial fishing going on. Places like the Adelaide, Darwin Harbour, Bino, the Phoenix, all of these systems that still, despite the fact there's no commercial fishing, aren't necessarily easy places to catch a fish. Which is important not to say that commercial fishing doesn't have any impact on barra. It clearly does. As soon as anyone's harvesting fish, you are impacting populations to some degree. Um, and there are other sort of social issues with that. Um, but in terms of the scale of you know, broad spatial scales, catchments, et cetera, the impacts are fairly benign, which is, yeah, supported by the um, by stock assessments, basically. Um, while these stock assessments do have um, some limitations, um, Barramundi is sitting at 88% of virgin biomass across the Northern Territory. King Trekman is sitting at 98%, according to the most recent stock assessment. So things are actually in pretty good shape. 
Having said all that, of course, there is still a very clear need to get better, to better refine these type of assessments and, and hone down on what's going on in individual catchments, which is something that everyone is crying out for. And absolutely, it'd be great to do, but there are still a few more years of data collection before that can really be achieved. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Eliza. I'm a wild harvest manager at Fisheries. Um, I work with people like Joe and Brian and our research team to manage our wild harvest fisheries sustainably, but to also manage them um, sustainably in accordance with our Fisheries Act. So I'll talk to you about a program that our team developed called Fisheries Management 101. This is just a slide that from a previous presentation. Um, we developed this program to be presented to Aboriginal communities around the Territory. Um, as most of you know, 85% of the Northern Territory coastline lays adjacent to Aboriginal land. Uh, traditional owners and Aboriginal communities around the Territory express their need and concerns on their lack of ability to engage in decision making and fisheries management. Uh, this includes intrusion of sacred sites, um, fishing impacts, on the environment and also um, food security. So we have acknowledged that there is a lack of data in the traditional knowledge space and that there is a need for us to capture those needs and values from Aboriginal communities. So Fisheries developed a pilot program, Fisheries Management 101. Um, this was developed uh, a few years ago with a team here. Um, there are six components that we broke fisheries <coughs> management down to. Uh, you've got collection of data, assessment of data, review controls, decisions, rules, along with conversation. So what Joe and Brian mentioned um, in regards to the research perspective, you have your data and your assessment, and then your fisheries management really comes into place, reviews, controls, decisions, and rules based on the, the science and the data that we have. Um, we reached out to multiple ranger groups um, in the past 18 months to deliver this program. Mm -hmm. um, we, the program was a game-based learning system. So I'm not sure if you guys remember from when you were kids, there's a game with the fish that open and close their mouth and you go fishing for them. We used that game to um, introduce fisheries management to rangers. Um, and it was really cool seeing a light bulb moment for them to understand how we manage fisheries from a westernised perspective. This was also a great opportunity for us to work with rangers to capture their values and their needs on how they manage fisheries, um, particularly capturing cultural indicators. So if a particular flower is blooming, they think it's a great time to go fishing for blue bone. So um, we definitely saw a trend across the Arnhem Land region of if a particular flower is blooming, they harvest for a particular species. Um, so that was pretty vital and eye-opening for our fisheries management team to capture. Uh, these are the marine ranger groups you can find along the Northern Territory coastline, and we presented to six of those, the Mike Mike rangers in the Daly region, Bowanunga, in the Manangrida, the Swamp Rangers in Ramangini, Dimaru and Yakala, and also the Leonti Awara Rangers. So as I mentioned before, this program went for over about 18 months. Um, the key learnings that we had from this is that COVID played a uh, very heavy role on how fisheries engage with Aboriginal communities. Uh, when we went out in 2022, around that time, uh, the Rangers expressed their need for fisheries to continue going out and engaging um, with them, not only about fisheries management, but also about compliance and research and biosecurity. Um, Face-to-face -face engagement was the most important part for us, particularly because we were delivering that game-based learning. Um, and something that I took home is that silence is really important in regards to delivering to rangers. Um, from a West Nice perspective, we're always rushing from A to B. And um, I took home that when people are silent and as they're interpreting. Uh, we really we relied heavily on senior rangers and traditional owners in the room to interpret for us. So that's a key learning that we will take on for when we deliver this program in the future. Um, we also found that there are components of this program that look quite complex. 
Um, when we talked about data and assessment, we um, had a case study where we talked about secure catch up in effort, and we used the game to kind of replicate that. But um, there were some times with particular groups where they kind of struggled to understand that some of the words and language that we used was a bit too sciencey for them. So uh, moving forward, when our project team goes out and delivers again, we will refine some of the components of that program to best fit the needs of our participants. Um, that's about it for key learnings. It's pretty short and sweet. We are wanting to run further programs with other Aboriginal communities around the Territory, along with key Aboriginal stakeholders as well. Um, I'm going to jump into careers at fisheries. Um, as most of you know or may know, we have a graduate program, but we also have an early careers program as well. So that's in the whole department. Um, for those of you who are students or no students who are interested in having some experience with fisheries or the department, um, check out our early careers program. There's the vacation employment program. So for those of you who want to get some employment during semester break, um, this is a great experience for you. This will get your foot into the door to work with us or other teams in the, in the department. There's also the graduate program, which provides you a year long employment with the department. Um, this is how I got into fisheries and I've been there for four years and now I'm a permanent um, employee there, which is great. Um, fisheries has an absolutely beautiful culture there and I encourage anyone that's interested to either talk to us or check out the QR code and um, go from there. Um, we are recruiting as well. If anyone's wanting to check that out. <laughs> um, lastly, just to wrap up this seminar, I just want to talk to you guys about the Australian Society for Fish Biology. I'm not sure if everyone's um, fishy kind of people in the room. Um, both Joe and I are members of this society. We sit, um, we are representatives of the Northern Territory and sit in the Executive Committee. The Society promotes research, uh, education and management of fish and fisheries in the Australasia region. Um, we have multiple subcommittees that sit under it. We have fisheries management, um, alien fish committee. Um, and a cool thing about this society is that they hold annual conferences. Last year it was in New Zealand. This year it's in Newcastle. Um, and this is a great opportunity for those fish people to share their information with the broader community. <coughs> Um, and I also want to flag that there is a potential for us to hold a Darwin conference in 2025. And the reason I'm raising this with you is that our ASFB membership in the Northern Territory is quite low and we're encouraging more people to become members. Um, and also, Joe and I can't do, if we were to hold the conference, Joe and I can't do all the heavy lifting ourselves with organising the conference. So there is a need to form a working group to support us with that. Um, for students that are interested in becoming a member of the society, it's really cheap. I think it's the cheapest membership in Australia. Uh, it's thirty dollars a year. Okay. Um, check that out. Uh, the benefits to becoming a member, you'll get a discounted um, ticket to our conference, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other uh, benefits to that as well. But um, Joe and I will be um, wandering around at the morning tea later. If you have any interest in becoming a member or have any questions. Uh, come and have a chat to us about that. Um, but short and sweet from me. Thank you guys for taking the time and attending today. Do you have any questions for us? Thanks, that was great. Um, I was interested in the, the uh, learnings that you took from your interaction with in the indigenous groups, because obviously, just as just as they found some of the science difficult to interpret in the way that and explain the way we would explain it, clearly their own interspecific indicators of the state of stocks are much more complex than just whether or not there's a flower blooming. And I wonder to what extent you gathered. You, you were able to gather information that, that they used to understand how the stocks are doing, uh, not just whether or not to fish. We, we didn't gather that, the, the data in that depth. It was a conversation that we had during our program where we asked uh, 
pretty much those environmental indicators for them. But in regards to attaining information on whether a fish stock is healthy or abundant, um, we could only capture that kind of concern they had of, I'm not catching a lot of fish compared to 20 years ago. So I think it was a great way to capture that cultural indicator from them, but also this was a great engagement for another, for this stakeholder group for us to capture their concerns. I um, just wanted to say thanks to you all for coming out and giving a, an overview of the work that's being done. Some of it I was aware of and, and some of it I wasn't. So it's really helpful to have, have that background information. And for a relatively small group, as you were saying, there's a lot of great things happening. I'm just wondering from your perspectives coming from different from research and management and a lot of you coming from CDU and now going to NT Fisheries what your ideas are in terms of the priority areas for management and research obviously kind of some of the areas that you're working in you think that's important but has anything stood out as is you know a, a priority area something that you're not doing that um, fisheries and and cdu could work together on either you know it could be quite specific or or, or general, but from your different areas, if there's any anything that comes to mind? Um, one thing that jumps to my mind straight away is looking into uh, some of this alternate, alternate oh, sorry, alternative ageing. Um, so the DNA methylation work um, is potentially something that we could um, look to collaborating on looking for external funding for some of that work. I think that would... Um, Broad, be broad enough to cover quite a few species um, in the NT and it would be really valuable stuff going mm. forward. Um, it's just something off the top of my head. Yeah, for sure. Um, I suppose, you know, a bit biased from my own research background, but I'd, I'd certainly think there's a lot more um, work to be done in terms of establishing linkages between flows and, and fishery productivity. Mm. And that meditation work would Bend itself to epigenomics as well. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's a lot of opportunities, um, and there is, I think, for uh, stuff that's going to inform management. There is a lot of potential funding available. Um, it would be yeah, really good to get some projects running. I had a question for Brian. I mean, this is not painted, but technology back, background, but also having come from Queensland, you know, looking at the, the fishery up here, and there's always been this real sort of blaming, finger pointing that goes on in the gillnet fishery, and yet most of your data is based on that because we actually have numbers. We don't have numbers from the recreational fishery. Yeah. But the other side of that is it's easy because we can get flow data. The other thing and especially now with the satellite technology that we have and LIDAR and all that stuff is to start looking at extent and condition of habitat in conjunction because you can have a good flow year in a river that might now be flogged out by, and this is my Queensland experience, all of the vast majority of our habitats have been turned into on the East Coast sugar cane. Yeah. So we don't have healthy habitat anymore like, like what we used to. You know, the burdekin is probably the best example. And the only reason the burdekin still functions is because of its all its its um uh, what do you call it the modified flows. Yeah, if yeah. they didn't have that, there would be no bear fishery there yeah. unless it was stopped. So you know, is there any consideration in the future for incorporating as well as your flow relationships? Because that was pretty brilliant. Like it has very little to do with fisheries management, and this is something that I used to have conversations with with Roldy because I worked with fisheries in '99 is you guys got habitat, truckloads of it, and that's really what drives it, as well as now you've got that clear relationship with, with flow. So some way of maybe taking into consideration the future, the condition and extent of habitat as well, because we're losing that as well. Like the Mary is a perfect example. So much freshwater habitat has actually been lost on the Mary because of intrusion. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's some of the stuff that's really sort of challenging. To, to manage, it's obviously on the one hand, you've got climate change, rising sea levels, that loss of that really productive sort of coastal freshwater floodplain habitat. 
and then obviously coupled with sort of development of water resources as well happening sort of more further inland it's it's certainly changing um which is very difficult to sort of specifically manage for um there was some work done so Dave Crook and, and John Morangello led some work looking at um modeling responses of, of of recruitment to different flow extraction scenarios yeah. so we have we have got some of that work that's been done um I suppose in a way we're sort of fortunate in the sense that the, the barramundi fishery is a relatively boutique fishery in the scheme of things it's we're not talking huge huge dollars that require really really sophisticated management so I suppose while it's something to very much be aware of mm -hmm. it's um yeah, pure, purely looking at it through sort of more of a management lens. It's, it's, you know. Yeah. I'm thinking more of you guys have an opportunity maybe to relate back to other places that have lost that habitat because, you know, the Gulf fishery and the East Coast fishery are treated very differently in Queensland for obvious reasons. Yeah. And a lot of that's driven by habitat and access. Yeah. But, you know, to be able to relate that back and maybe, you know, help them understand that habitat restoration is actually a big part of management, not yeah, just yeah, yeah. lines in the water and hooks in the water. Yeah. I just, you know, I, I guess I'm just putting that out there because it's something that having come from Queensland to the territory and going back, you know, you really notice. And, you know, like we've got people here that are doing a lot of stuff with LIDAR and looking at extent and duration of inundation, which yeah. I think if we could get the money to do it and go out and study it with, you know, our carbon uh, stabilized isotopes and fatty acids is actually the importance of those super littoral habitats yeah. because they'll start diminishing as water extraction increases. So anyway, just yeah. I mean something you and I can talk about in the future. <laughs> but that graph was awesome because they didn't have that back in the day. You guys blinked that really well. I'm Eliza, I'm your sales pitch. We didn't mention the subscription for the APIS fees will be going up, so people can get in. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to be a member to attend the conference, so, but yes, that was a good strong encouragement. Yeah. 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 Question about were you saying that um, in a few years' time, you're having kind of better data about stock assessments of the catchment? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Research programs? Uh, so it's so everyone has been falling to the Barramundi Fishery Red Quota for a long time. But they're basically coming from everyone uh, in the industry. Uh, everyone wants a quota managed fishery, um, which which is great. But that's very challenging to do on some sort of meaningful spatial scale. So if we're looking at individual sort of catchments, individual populations, got a very got to have a very good idea of what biomass actually is. And how much biomass fluctuates through time. So what we're looking at collecting in those sort of sort of key areas where more fishing is occurring is basically getting some better biology data. So getting some getting more total collection, more age collection, age length data, um, and basically hopefully trying to put it into some sort of stock synthesis model to, to come up with biomass estimates to go out and close as it is. And where are you attaching to your folks? I'm presumably kind of more. Yeah, yeah. So the, the line hanging fruit at the moment would be Anson Bay and the Roper, probably at the moment. Um, essentially, depending on what happens with um, fishing in other areas, like Glenmore Bay and Bay. Um, yeah. and You've also got the challenge where um, you've got different components of the population in different areas, and you know there's not much mixing between freshwater component of the population and the saltwater component of the population, and the fishing pressure is all focused on the social on the on the on the downstream side of things. So I don't have an answer yet, but <laughs> so thank you very much for our speakers. I think as experts in environmental issues, uh, we all have to learn how to cooperate better, right? And adjust the level of the language and communicating better. So is where the message for me by the end. And that's also one of the targets of the real seminar series, of course, you know. <laughs>
But yeah, let's continue in the yellow two building and we go for the morning tea. Everybody's invited. Thanks for our, our online participants. And if anyone would like to volunteer for a presentation anytime, just drop in a, a message. We also need two or three volunteers for organizing the room here now. Just be here and then we tell you what to do. Thanks a lot and see you in the two weeks. <laughs>